Hello, it's Saturday, which means it's R&R. &R. Um, I'm Phil. And I'm Jill. And together we are Phil and... Jill. Brilliant. Uh, so welcome, it's Saturday. Uh, we're going to shake things up this week. Uh, this is not really the most controversial change ever, uh, but this week Jill is going to share three recommendations and I'll share three recommendations next week. Uh, so all three of these recommendations are Jill approved uh, this week. There's no tag or anything too laddish this week. Uh, so Jill, uh, what's your book that you're recommending this week? Okay, well, my book is uh, Daring Greatly by Brené Brown, who, um, she's pretty well known, and really her whole career took off when she did a TED talk on vulnerability. I think she's probably quite well known before then, but um, you can Google it and go and listen to her TED talk on being vulnerable. And this book, Daring Greatly, How the Courage to be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, love, parent and lead. And uh, there's a, a quote here, if you want to live life more fully, just read this book. So um, I got it for Christmas a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, I would have loved to have had it when I was actually doing parenting with, with my young, young girls. Um, I'm going to read the introduction and then um, a manifesto, which is at the end. So she starts the book um, by saying, the phrase daring greatly is from Theodore Roosevelt's speech, Citizenship in a Republic. The speech sometimes referred to as the man in the arena was delivered at the Sorbonne in Paris, France on April the 23rd, 1910. This is the passage that made the speech famous. So some of you may be familiar with this um, and I'm going to read it all because it's just such good stuff. Um, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who becomes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause? who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. Ah, that's just fabulous, isn't it? And she says, um, the first time I read this quote, I thought, this is vulnerability. Everything I've learned from over a decade, decade of research on vulnerability has taught me this exact lesson. Vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat. It's understanding the necessary of both. It's engaging. It's being all in. Vulnerability is not weakness and the uncertainty, risk and emotional exposure we face every day are not optional. Our only chance is a question of engagement. Our willingness to own and engage with our own vulnerability determines the depth of our courage and the clarity of our purpose. The level to which we protect ourselves from being vulnerable is a measure of our fear and disconnection. When we spend our lives waiting until we're perfect or bulletproof before we walk into the arena, we ultimately sacrifice relationships and opportunities that may not be recoverable. We squander our precious time and we turn our backs on our gifts those unique contributions that only we can make. And she goes on, perfect and bulletproof are seductive, but they don't exist in the human experience. We must walk into the arena, whatever it may be, a new relationship, an important meeting, our creative process, or a difficult family conversation with courage and the willingness to engage. Rather than sitting on the sidelines and hurling judgment and advice, we must dare to show up and let ourselves be seen. This is vulnerability. This is daring greatly. So what do you think of that, Phil? Brilliant. I, I've not read the book, uh, but her TED talk, we used to, um, we had to watch it at college, actually. They, 
they made us sit down and watch it. Um, so it's uh, it, it's college approved, but it's yeah. the interesting thing is we were having the conversation before we started recording, weren't we, about whether she's a Christian or not. Yeah. And we don't know, but we, we think she might be. And it's just interesting that this wisdom yeah. we hear, we think, oh, this must be Christian. And it's, it, there's something just timelessly wise in there, isn't there? Yeah. She, she's a very good communicator. So it's not not a difficult read, but it, I would I would say it's quite an important read. So so daring greatly, Brené Brown, and um, because it's Mother's Day or Mothering Sunday tomorrow, I want to read um, this manifesto that she has at the end of the book. And again, just bear with me while I read it. It's quite challenging, but I I just think it's beautiful, and it is. You know, if you live by these standards, you are, are doing a, a, a good job for your family and for, for the world at large. And she calls it the wholehearted parenting manifesto. Above all else, I want you to know that you are loved and lovable. You will learn this from my words and actions. The lessons on love are in how I treat you and how I treat myself. I want you to engage with the world from a place of worthiness. You will learn that you are worthy of love, belonging and joy every time you see me practice self-compassion and embrace my own imperfections. We will practice courage in our family by showing up, letting ourselves be seen and honouring vulnerability. We will share our stories of struggle and strength. There will always be room in our home for both. We will teach you compassion by practicing compassion with ourselves first, then with each other. We will set and respect boundaries. We will honor hard work, hope and perseverance. Rest and play will be family values as well as family practices. You will learn accountability and respect by watching me make mistakes and make amends and by watching how I ask for what I need and talk about how I feel. I want you to know joy so together we will practice gratitude. I want you to feel joy so together we will learn how to be vulnerable. When uncertainty and scarcity visit you will be able to draw from the spirit that is a part of our everyday life. Together we will cry and face fear and grief. I will want to take away your pain, but instead I will sit with you and teach you how to feel it. Oh, it makes me cry. Um, we will laugh and sing and dance and create. We will always have permission to be ourselves with each other no matter what, you will always belong here. As you begin your wholehearted journey, the greatest gift that I can give to you is to live and love with my whole heart and to dare greatly. I will not teach or love or show you anything perfectly, but I will let you see me and I will always hold sacred the gift of seeing you. Truly, deeply seeing you. Um, you can download a copy of that manifesto from her website, which is www.brenebrown.com. And I think this thing about um, children knowing that they are seen or knowing that they are heard um, is, is really important. And, you know, as, as adults, we think that what we do, you know, generally has priority. Um, but children will learn their own worth as we give worth and value to them. So I don't mean to preach or anything, but it's just, it, it's a really sound and good book, book to read. So it won't apply for everyone. Some people will feel they've been there, done that, and it's you know, behind them. But for those of you who just want to learn more about being vulnerable, I've learned a lot from it, actually. It has, it's made me far more relaxed uh, about just trying to be who, who I am and not putting on a, a sort of face of veneer um, because there's no value in that really. What's the point in doing that? Exactly. 
Yeah, no, it sounds like a print book. I, I will, I will go check it out. I will Ooh, oh see God. if I can find a copy. You've got a, <laughs> if you've got an affiliate link, I could you could you see get some commission. <laughs> I just thought it was very appropriate, beans. As um, you know, we've got Mothering Sunday coming up, so parenting manifesto of being vulnerable. I thought that was a goodie. Yeah. Right. Uh, so now um, for something completely different. Um, uh, tell us about the film that you've um, that you've chosen this week, Jill. Oh, this film, it's just the most wonderful film. I watched it over the Christmas holidays, so I, I couldn't remember all of it. So I just watched the trailer and it came back to me again. And it's about, um, have I said what the title was? Uh, not yet, no. No, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the title is The Peanut Butter Falcon. And it's about a, a chap who has Down syndrome, Zach, who is uh, 22 and he loves wrestling. He watches the wrestling on the TV and he wants to go to the school. Um, it's called the Saltwater Redneck uh, School of Wrestling. And his hero, he sees him do this special throw um, and, and he just relives this. Anyway, he keeps trying to escape from the care home he's in. And one day he manages to do it. And then um, he meets this, um, what do they call him? A small time outlaw on the run, Tyler. And the couple, they, they make friends with each other and they have a journey together. And it's, it's just beautiful the way the story unfolds and really their commitment to each other unfolds as well because there's this tough guy who won't have any nonsense you know and um Zach has just tagged along with him you know he hasn't wanted him but then he's in the boat you know and then he follows him to um a diving plank or something and starts trying to dive in and anyway so Tyler realizes he needs a bit of help and there's a lot I don't want to spoil it for you because you'll enjoy it every, everyone will love this it's anyone can watch it um, and uh, where am I? So the, there's little bits. Um, Tyler, as they set off, and I think he's given him some welly boots or something because he's got no shoes on his feet. I can't remember. Anyway, they go in along this track and Tyler turns around and says, uh, you're going to say with me, there's two rules, you know. Rule number one is you do what I say. Number two is, I can't remember what it is. And he says, so he looks at Zach and he says, so um, what's rule number one? And Zach just looks at him and says, party. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he just trundles along behind him and, and poor Tyler, like Zach really, uh, you know, drags him uh, and he's trying to escape from these folks who are after him. Anyway, it's very funny. And the girl from the care home who really loves Zach, she's 28, uh, she's set on a mission to bring him back to the care home. So, and there's a little bit of thing going on between her and Tyler as well. Anyway, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but the climax is absolutely beautiful. It's very poignant. It's beautifully filmed. There's lots of humour in it. Um, so someone said it's about um, friends being the family you choose and I just love the relationships these odd odd bods um, together just really loving each other you know it just it's one of those films that really gets to the bottom of what it is to be human um, let me just read this the movie came about because the directors met Zach Gottesgen, who is the actor, at a camp for um, disabled and non-disabled people. Uh, I'm not sure if that's politically correct to say that, but anyway, we'll say it because it's there. And he expressed his desire to be a movie star. So the directors wrote the script around him and Zach's hopes and dreams that bled into the script and people they knew who would allow them to film for free and without permits. Um, so it's funny, I'd resisted watching it because I, I sort of didn't want it to be cliched or corny and it wasn't. It's, it, it's absolutely lovely and I would challenge anyone to watch it and not appreciate it. Um, oh, there's one bit that I thought I would just share again. 
um, they're, they're swimming over a river and uh, there's a huge boat sort of on the horizon and Zach can't swim. And he, he calls out to Zach, uh, Tyler, Tyler, am I going to die? And Tyler says, <laughs> the swimming, yes, it's a matter of time, but that ain't the question. The question is whether you're going to have a good story to tell when you die. And then the boat comes <laughs> and Zach, you just see him flailing around. And then they get to the shore together and Tyler turns to Zach and he says, you're going to have a good story now. <laughs> it's just, uh, there's lots of, you know, really nice little bits. Yeah, I'm going to watch it again. I don't usually watch films twice, but some are worth, worth watching twice, aren't they? Brilliant. So that is the Peanut Butter Falcon, is that right? That's so correct. That's... It's a funny name, isn't it? But you'll find out why it's called that when you watch the film. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, finally, we've got our song for the week. What song are you recommending this week? Well, so I've chosen Dolly Parton singing I Will Always Love You, um, which she made famous and Whitney Houston made famous. So I think Dolly wrote it in 1974 and Whitney, it became famous when as part of the body, Bodyguard. Yeah. In, in, in the 90s, wasn't that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I've done my research. Um, so, oh, I think that the song anyway, it is just so emotional and it gets your heartstrings when you listen to it. Like Dolly Parton has a way of doing that. Um, but this song, do you know the story of it, Phil? I don't think, I oh, don't good. think so. Don't. So... People think it's romantic. They think it's about um, the breakup of a romantic relationship. But actually, um, when Dolly Parton set out, she had a five year contract with um, a chap that all the Americans would know, Porter Wagoner. Um, and um, it was he that really brought her to fame. Um, and towards the end of the contract, uh, Dolly realised it was time to part company, but Porter refused to let her go, and they really came to blows about it. And she, she was clearly very upset. She wanted to go on her own way, and she went home and she wrote the song. And um, oh, it just—I am soppy, aren't I? I want to cry because then the next day she went to Porter and she said, "Can I give you?" can you give me a minute of your time so he did and she sang the song to him and um the words are and they're just so simple and i think that's where the power lies um the words are if i should stay i would only be in your way and so i'll go but i know i'll think of you each step of the way and i will always love you I will always love you. You you know this song. You can listen to it again. And she sings it to him. And uh, Porter cr cries. It breaks down and cry uh, cries. And he says, "If it means that much to you, then okay, off you go. Um, on one condition that you will let me produce your album." And so he produced her first. I don't know if it's her first album, but the Jolene album of which I will always love you is uh, one of the songs on it. Um, so that's a beautiful song and, and I sort of love it because it's about a professional relationship and it's about the partnership that two people can have, um, which is not sexual, but it, they love one another because they get each other and they create wonderful things together and it's genuine and it's deep and it's heartfelt and it's real a real relationship and you know in life I think most people are very fortunate to get that sort of relationship now and then but they're very precious mm -hmm. you know we can't take those sort of relationships for us and hit for granted and here Dolly is uh, re recognizing that if she's going to fill her dreams and ambitions, she's got to let Porter Wagner go and he has to let her go. And, you know, this woman is stepping out um, on her own. 
And so the feminist in me, yeah, go, Dolly, go. <laughs> and, you know, she, she made it, didn't she? But without him there in the first place, who, who knows? She may, she, may, she may have done, she's very talented, or she may not. But it, it was very painful. I mean, the song just comes right out of the middle of her, her being. It's so painful, and she sings it so beautifully. Now, you'll, you'll want me to, well... I think you want me to Christianize this a little bit, maybe. Um, please, or... please Christianize this, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> so the verse or the passages of scripture that it reminds me of, I think is, a, is Philippians 3. And it's about th Philippians 3 verse 12 starting, not that I've already obtained all of this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. I think I might have um, quoted that passage before for something else. And the thing is with Dolly Parton, you know, we we know what she looks like. We know where she's invested, you know, quite a lot of money in her appearance. Um, and yet, you know, her calling, I think she's a woman of faith, um, you know, and and her calling is to write and sing these these beautiful songs that that relate to everyday life and everyone's experiences. And, you know, in that she is obeying Jesus Christ. She is following the gifting that she has. It's not all about church, you know, like we, we need to get out of that and just think about where our talents and gifts and where our heart lies and pursue that, pursue our dreams. Um, and I, I believe if we do that, you know, with vulnerability and courage, um, God will get us to where 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 He wants us to go. Um, yeah, is that, is that okay? Good, no, uh, no, sorry, I'm I'm just sitting quietly because I I, I I love Dolly Parton. She's um, she does a lot of Christian music as well, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. But she's um, I actually it's sort of paradoxical, I think. You know. Yeah. She's... <laughs> Which is quite the saying it costs a lot of money to look this cheap, I think was the <laughs> quote she <laughs> heard somewhere about her. But um <laughs> she's an amazing woman, yeah. isn't she? You know, she really is, I think. So but I I, I was briefly I, I I had an unsuccessful pressure group that I tried to start in the Church of England called Make Church More Country, which um, <laughs> was campaigning for more Dolly Parton songs in Sunday worship. Um <laughs> but it, it didn't catch on. It didn't. Oh, maybe we could give you an opportunity. opportunity. I just need a platform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that bombshell, <laughs> thank you uh, so much for watching. Uh, we'll be back next week. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me.